Okay, here we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Marty Kotler. I'm the president of Target Coding. I want to thank everybody for attending this presentation. This is going to be a really good one. I'm very excited about this presentation. We're going to be talking about how to improve your patient outcomes and bottom line with back braces and cervical traction. So, before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Marty Kotler. I'm a chiropractor. I'm the president of Target Coding. I'm certified in CPT coding, certified in compliance. I'm also a contributing author to Chiropractic Economics and Dynamic Chiropractic. I'm a member of the ACA and American Academy of Professional Coders and a member of many state association uh, state associations. I'm a featured speaker for the Coding Institute, Parker Seminars, and for Foot Levelers. We also have a couple of guest speakers joining us on today's presentation. The first one is Dr. Fred Graff. He is a diplomate in orthopedics. He's a practicing chiropractor for over 25 years, and he's currently the medical director for, for Metolutions. Also joining us today is Dr. John LaMonica, also in practice for over 25 years. He's the president of the New York Chiropractic Council, first vice president of COXA, which is the Congress of Chiropractic State Associations. I'd also like to let everyone know that this webinar is being sponsored by Valpro Supplies. We're going to speak a little bit more about Valpro Supplies a little bit later. So let's get right into it. You see, um, DME is very attractive for a, a, a lot of uh, chiropractors. Um, to me, it, it provides an excellent overall approach to helping patients get better and it could also improve your income and there's a lot of different types of DME um, when you hear orthotics a lot of chiropractors think oh that's foot levelers foot orthotics no orthotics apply to the spine to elbows to braces to knees so there's a lot of different types of orthotics a lot of types of DME available but I've narrowed it down in this webinar to two lumbar braces and home use cervical traction equipment so I'm going to bring on the first guest speaker right now, Dr. Graff, who's going to talk to you about lumbar bracing. Dr. Graff, please join us. Thank you, Dr. Kotler. First of all, I'd like to thank your audience and, and all those in attendance for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend today's webinar. My goal here today is to provide information about low back bracing and to help make you more comfortable in identifying the appropriate braces of choice for your patients should you decide a brace is appropriate for their needs. First of all, I'd like to just talk about the prevalence of low back pain. There are many statistics out there, but uh, low back pain accounts for about 2.5% of outpatient visits annually. And it's the most common reason patients will visit the underlying uh, physicians listed below. Primary care physicians are not listed here, but I can tell you statistically, low back pain, uh, they see uh, it's the second most reason uh, a patient will visit their offices, exceeded by only colds and flus. Low back pain will account for about 2.63 million emergency room visits annually, and it's the leading cause of disability worldwide. Next. Next. There's a little bit of a delay, Dr. Graff, so. You'll okay. see the next slide right now. Thank you. Again, um, one half of uh, working Americans admit to having low back symptoms each year. Low back pain, again, is a major cause of pain and disability with an estimated 160 million work days lost annually with a cost of approaching $50 billion. More common causes that we see every day in our practices are listed here in this chart. Certainly it's not an exhaustive list, but the more common ones we see on a routine basis. The impact that these conditions will have on our systems, first either through an exacerbation or an acute injury, uh, inflammation will occur, followed by muscle hypertonicity, which leads to reduced function and range of movement, increased pain, and a lower quality of life. Once a patient presents to our office for an evaluation, we commonly will take a history, perform the appropriate examinations, and come up with a differential in diagnosis. Next. Um, once a differential diagnosis has been rendered, uh, we, will, we will come up with a treatment plan, goals for such 
uh, and goals for and, and goals for the plan. Some of which are listed here in this chart, though it's not a complete list. Uh, orthosis comes from the Greek word ortho, which means to straighten or align. Braces can provide many uh, treatment um, options or treatment uh, uh, results, some of which are listed in this chart uh, list below. Uh, I want to focus on improvement in function because a lot of you out there may think bracing, uh, if you're going to use a supportive brace, it's just for the purpose of immobilization. But I'm going to really focus today on how braces in your practice today can improve one's function while we're leaving pain. Next. The use of back braces date back to the Middle Ages and were custom made by armors to correct for spinal deformities. The first, the first documented uh, a use of a back brace date, uh, was reported in, 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 seven, in the 1700s. There are two categories of bracing I want to focus on here today, functional and restrictive. Functional braces are braces that are usually smaller in profile, minimally restrictive, and are used to improve functionability. Restrictive braces are just like the name says. They're typically bigger, bulkier, and, and, and are designed to restrict, restrict function and are used for certain medical conditions. Next. There are no universal standards or guidelines when using a brace. I want everybody to be aware of that. Each patient should have a specific treatment plan for the brace utilization. Some general guidelines when using a brace is to consider using a functional brace or a restrictive brace when the patients are experiencing pain or when they're performing an activity that commonly triggers pain. I have a lot of times patients coming into my office telling me that while sitting in front of the computer for three or four hours or shopping for three or four hours, their back pain tends to be aggravated or exacerbated. That might be an appropriate time to consider brace usage. If you do decide to use a brace, certainly reassessment and peri periodical uh, evaluation is appropriate for continued use. Next. What do medical guidelines say about bracing? ACOM suggests that any treatment or therapy that helps retur uh, return patients to normal activity has the best long-term outcomes. Successful therapies that focus on restoring functionality without truly focusing on pain have the best uh, long-term outcomes as, as well. Next. Mercy guidelines. Mercy states that bracing, casting, supports, and orthotics are considered useful components in chiropractic care and are classified and categorized uh, as class two medical evidence. ODG states that uh, braces are useful in subacute conditions. And this was referenced in a randomized control uh, trial performed by Dr. Camels in 2009, who indicated that low back braces were, were effective at reducing pain, um, restoring function, and re reducing medication consumption. Braces under ODG guidelines are recommended for compression fractures, documented instabilities, and post-operative treatment, but not recommended for prevention, though there's a lot of controversy regarding this topic. Next. Anatomy of a back brace. How does it work? Commonly, what you'll see is the pressure receptors in the dermis of the abdomen are stimulated, which send signals through the peripheral nervous system, synapsing in the cord, traveling through the basal ganglion and synapsing in the cerebral cortex for interpretation of, of information. Next. Once the uh, cerebral cortex receive the signals, they are interpreted, next, and sent down through descending pathways through the midbrain, the lateral cortical spinal tracts, through the cord, and out through lower motor neurons and ventral spinal roots to the end organ for uh, reduction in muscle tone, typically. Next. Determining the appropriate brace to use. There are many categories of braces. The ones you're probably all familiar with are the nylon and elastic wrap braces. These braces tend to offer some sort of support 
but are not restrictive in nature. These, use, these are typically used for more uh, simple cases and are used to help remind the patients that a back problem exists. Lumbar orthosis, uh, HIC-PIX code LO627, is considered a functional brace. It's a smaller brace than um, the more restrictive ones that are on the market today. It runs from L1 to L5, generally appropriate for up to 85% of all back conditions that you'll see in your office, as most back conditions are, uh, are focused and located at the L1 through L5 region. And it's generally covered by medical pairs when medical necessity is documented. It's used for a wide range of acute and chronic conditions. Next. The next two categories of braces are considered restrictive braces in nature. Lumbosacral orthosis LO631 and lumbosacral orthosis with sagittal coronal control LO637. Both of these braces will cover a region from the sacral coccygeal junction through the T9 region. Both these braces are designed for helping to stabilize the condition or generally uh, used to help immobilize uh, the lower back in conditions such as fracture, post-surgical uh, situations, and documented instability. The uh, lumbosacral lateral or, or the, lumb the LO627 uh, brace, uh, the difference between that and the LO631 is the LO637 will come with rigid lateral panels, which the LO631 brace does not. So the LO637 uh, brace is the much more stable brace uh, of the two and more restrictive as well. Next. Now I'd like to talk about the bio-back specifically. As you can see, this picture demonstrates the bio-back on the reading right is smaller in design and it's more lightweight than the bigger LO631 you have on your reading left. Next. The effective use for bioback and rehabilitation and treatment. The bioback again is considered a fu functional brace, so it helps the patients regain mobility. As was indicated prior in the medical standards, any treatment that focuses on restoration of function has effective long-term outcomes. Since the bioback is small and lightweight in design, it, it, it um, helps improve uh, patient compliance while improving clinical outcomes. The bioback also is effective at relieving pain and reducing muscle hypertonicity. Next. The unique features regarding the bioback. What makes the bioback unique is its bilateral posing forces and lumbar dome design. What you're probably thinking about when you're thinking about lumbar braces is a design that tends to wrap around the abdomen. The bioback does not do that. It has two panels, one placed in the abdomen, one placed in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, over the spine, and when and compressed through with a strapping mechanism, creates an intercavitary pressure which helps, which helps balance the load across the, uh, the lower back region. So what we're doing is redistributing forces to take tension out of the low back region. Typically what happens when the back is injured, muscles become hypertonic and restrict function. So anything that we can do to change the tone of the deep and superficial muscles of the back to promote function is a benefit to our patients. The bioback also comes with a lumbar dome, which helps to create immediate correction and posture. So if we can align our spines more correctly, uh, we're going to have better functionability and reduce pain. Again, the bioback is a low-profile design, making it easier for patients to wear compared to larger, bulkier braces that are uh, more restrictive in nature. Next. The bioback um, underwent uh, EMG evaluations uh, via uh, a chiropractic neurologist. What was found was uh, a 46 percent reduction in muscle tone of the multifidus and longissimus muscles when the bioback was tightened to 16 pound, pound forces while the patients were in neutral spine position. That was dramatic. Consider uh, a patient having a reduction in 46% of hypertonic muscle tone uh, in an acute or subacute scenario. Anything that can do this is going to foster and promote function and reduce pain. Next. The 
BioBac was evaluated in pain management settings. So these are the worst of the worst of uh, back pain sufferers. Biobacks were um, utilized by these patients for a three, three month to one year period. And when these patients were asked to complete surveys, what was revealed were 84% of these chronic pain sufferers would recommend the bioback. 78% reported pain relief. 73% reported pain prevention. And 7% reported a decrease in opioid consumption, which I thought was the best of all the statistics in this report. Next. Documenting medical necessity. In today's medical environment, it's, it's very important that we all document necessity for any and all of our treatments. The, the way to document medical necessity when utilizing a bioback is very simple. Next. How I would do this is when a patient comes in in acute or subacute condition, I would have them bend forward to the point of increased pain and record the mo movement. Once I have that data, I would apply the bio back and ask them to repeat the same function. Then I would record the data. My expectations would be to see a 10 to 30 percent improvement in function. Next. Once we've documented improvement in mobility, I would then establish uh, uh, a pain management scale be implemented. Next. Anything that would change uh, a pain level of two has meaningful, uh, is, is meaningful data. So I would have the patient record their pain levels at the time of presentation, and then after wearing or utilizing the bio back for a 15-minute period, I would have them repeat their assessment of their pain level. Again, meaningful changes of two go a long way in supporting documentation and medical necessity of the bioback. Next. We, here's some sample medical uh, necessity documentation that we, we will provide for your needs. Next. Here's a chart that's been filled out with a patient, uh, a subacute patient or acute patient coming into your offices with restricted, and func uh, with restricted functions and improvement in functions utilizing the bioback. And as you can see at the bottom of the chart, there was a pain scale evaluation noted as well. Next. Here are just some, uh, here's a list of contraindications that you need to keep in mind when utilizing the bioback. I would not use the bioback in a pregnancy situation as there are more appropriate braces on the market for this. I would not use the bioback in, in fractures of lower back that require immobilization, as this is more of a functional brace designed to, to restore function, not limit it. I would not use this brace with tumors uh, of the spine, nor would I use it for infections in the lower back region. And that concludes my part of this presentation. Um, there will be a, a short question and answer session, as I understand, at the end of the presentation. So now I will turn it back over to Dr. Kotler and continue for him to continue on with the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Graff. That was excellent information. And I just want to remind everyone that this webinar is being sponsored by Valpro Supplies. Valpro Supplies is one of the um, uh, dealers, that uh, distributors of the BioBack. So if you're interested in learning more about the BioBack, contact Val so uh, Valpro Supplies at one 855 779 2076 again 1855 779 2076 and ask for Claire this webinar is also being brought to you by target coding so if you're interested in learning more about target coding call toll free 1-800-270-7044 and ask for Amy also a little bit about target coding um, for those of you that um, do not know what we do um, we offer billing, coding, and documentation um, consulting services, products, webinars, seminars. We also have something called our Smart Choice Program. This program will help you swan. Swan means sleep well at night. So if you're interested in learning about this, let us know. This program is about a three to six week program depending upon the practice, how big the practice is. Again, it's only about three to six weeks. It's not a one year program. And we go through how to prevent audits, how to know you're strategically billing insurance companies 
properly, how to collect cash from many services, making sure you're not underbilling. Some doctors are so afraid of audits that they're underbilling. We'll also teach you how to code to the highest degree of specificity, especially with ICD-10 coming around the corner real soon, how to prevent dual fee schedules, how to implement DME, how to get your staff members trained to show you how to maximize revenue, when not to use modifiers 52 and 59, know how to build time codes properly. So let us know if you're interested in that. All you need to do is go to targetcoding.com, click on the services page, and you'll see the information about our Smart Choice programs. Also, we offer memberships for those of you that would like a little bit more um, information over a one-year program. We have one-year memberships. This includes a lot more information than our Smart Choice programs. These memberships include unlimited Q&A support, plus you could attend our seminars and webinars. We have basic, silver, gold, and DCPT. Again, if you're interested in our memberships, go to targetcoding.com, click on the services page, we also have a whole bunch of seminars coming up on ICD-10. They're starting next week. Call 1-800-270-7044 to get information on our upcoming seminars. Get on our e-newsletter list. We send out a nice email newsletter every month giving you um, information on the latest on billing and coding. So if you're interested in our seminars, go to targetcoding.com, click on the seminars page, and you'll see our complete list. All right, so now we are going to switch gears now, and we're going to talk about cervical traction. And our guest speaker for this portion is Dr. LaMonica. Dr. LaMonica, please join us. Thank you, Dr. Kotler. First, I'd like to thank also everyone on the webinar today, and I'd also like to thank you, Dr. Marty, for hosting this, and it's my pleasure being here today. Next, please. Yeah, we're going to speak about cervical traction, neck pain, and the use of cervical traction when we talk about cervical conditions. Next. Next, please. Thank you. Just some general information I'd like to go through quickly. It's a lifetime incidence, rates as high as 54%. The National Institute of Health Statistics report that neck pain would occur in approximately 15.4% 15 15 of adults, migraine 16.6, of which 20 to 25% would be cervical genic in nature and in origin, and one-third of patients will develop chronic symptoms and a condition. Some of the most common causes, of course, are injury and overuse of the muscles, ligaments, and joints. We have disc bulging and herniations. We have degeneration, which is due to either age and or trauma, and pressure on the nerve roots in the vertebral canal. Less common, of course, are fractures, infections, and tumors, but we need to be aware of those also. There are a couple of different sources of pain and functional losses. We have localized neck pain. We also have the cervical genic, radicular pain, and cervical radiculopathy. There are differences, root causes, and treatment options for each, which we'll go through very briefly. Localized neck pain is basically caused by disorders of the cervical spine. You have soft tissues, strain or sprain. You have a disc herniation, prolapse, protrusion, bulges. You have mechanical joint related. And you also have tension or pressure on the dura mater and vertebral arteries. So cervical genic pain is a type of radicular pain associated with headaches. You have a lot of times focusing on the occipital and lateral lantoaxial joints involving as well as C2s and the C3 joint. The radicular pain, also caused by disorders of the cervical spine, usually has a shooting, stabbing, or electric type of nature, uh, traveling distantly distally into the affected limb. There's compression of the dorsal root ganglion, which evokes a sustained afferent, afferent fiber activity, which affects the A, B, and C fibers. And there is a growing contention with alternative thinking that inflammation is a major cause of not only nerve root conditions, but various conditions. So we have to consider that as, a, as when, we, when we decide on what kind of uh, treatment and conditions we need to, to focus upon. Cervical radiculopathy, of course, is a neurologic condition 
but it's characterized by a combination of sensory loss, motor loss, impaired reflexes, which is a segmental distribution. It's usually not a, a, associated with the direct cause of the pain. It usually is a compression or compromise of the cervical spine nerve or its root or its axon. The axons of the nerves either compress directly or rendered ischemic by compression of blood supply. The symptoms of sensory or motor loss result as a block of conduction along the affected axon. The compression of the axon alone does not usually elicit pain, and there's many causes, of course, that have been reported, such as discs, uh, dicopophical joints, the vertebral bodies, the meninges, the blood vessels, the nerve sheets. What does it, what does it uh, come out as? It comes out as pain and discomfort, limited function and quality of life, there's a disability and loss of earnings, addiction to medications, psychosocial and general health implications. Treatment objectives, of course, again, are restoration of the function is primary for rehabilitation in both acute and chronic. You also want to consider the pain relief, which is generally the patient's number one priority, but we need to make them realize that pain is the beginning of the process and we need to get them restored in function so they have a full, if possible, recovery. You want to also reduce, can you go back a second, Marty, please? You also want a reduce, reducing the, the swelling and inflammation wherever applicable and a quick and safe return to full activity. Thank you. Talking about the efficacy of cervical traction, there is many, many research and articles out there that support cervical traction. Just a few that they always state that the supine position is superior to the seated position for providing cervical traction. It definitely provides more consistent positioning. It's easier for the patient to relax. There's less tension, which leads to improved efficacy. The elimination of extra variables, uh, example, as the weight, the weight of the patient's head. The, the unit that we're going to be discussing follows these guidelines and are used in these positions. Also, it's been documented by uh, Judovic that 25 to 45 pounds is needed to create a measurable change in posterior cervical spine structures. And in a controlled study, Diver Gold and Piper demonstrated that patients receiving 25 pounds of traction had better outcomes than the control group. Clinical evidence shows that mid and lower cervical spine separation occurs at either greater than or equal to a 20, 20 pounds and the, the unit that we're going to be discussing does both of those things. When you identify, similar to what we did in the lower back, as Dr. Graff showed, we have the disorders or general descriptions of disorders. These are definitely not an all-inclusive and, and not just by themselves, but you see them on the, on the screen where you have the headache and whiplash and degenerative joint diseases, and you, show, and you see on the right that you have treatment goals, a lot of which are, are the same, some of the same goals. Next one. Now, the, the unit we're going to be speaking about a little bit as a, as a cervical contraction is, some, is, is a product called PRODOS. PRODOS is, of course, an acronym for Positional Restoration and Traction of the Spine. And that by the name alone, it still tells you that not only does it provide traction to the cervical spine, but a key feature of this unit is that it maintains the position or helps to restore the function, position, and the normal cervical lordosis, which is very key in, in many cervical conditions. It's also very key in what we do as chiropractors, and we know the, 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 the incidences of decreased cervical lordosis in the, in the society. It's one of, it is the most versatile traction unit on the market today. Next, please. And as I just stated, it's not only axial traction, but it does have curve restoration. It's, it's a portable and easy to use unit. It can be done in office or at the home. So you can use it as a treatment mechanism in addition to your adjustment in the office, and then you would want to give this to the patient at home so that they have the compliance and the time to use to get the benefits and results that you want. The first benefit of this unit is 
that it is designed as a lower profile to start. So what happens is that it's, it's a much more comfortable unit to the patient to begin using, especially when they're acute and they're in some discomfort and pain. Uh, most of the other units that are on the market are a higher profile and puts more direct pressure on the spine to begin with. So this allows you to, to have a smaller person use this much more easily and much more comfortably uh, to start out with. If you have a bigger person with the included legs, you can all, always rise it up to where it's a comfortable level for them to get a better pressure on that area of the spine. Now, if you also notice, this is the only unit on the market that does not do any form of traction in one position. A lot of units out there will do traction only in flexion. There are other units that do them only in neutral. Now, with the different types of modalities, with the different type of uh, techniques that we have in chiropractic, different doctors like to use different forms of traction just by their theory and philosophy of what they need to be done. In that sense, this unit, the Prados, can be done in neutral, of course, but it also can be done, done in three degrees of extension, flexion, or rotation. So people that feel that the patient's main concern would be better in flexion, you can do that. In a lot of techniques use extension traction. And some techniques use mirror imaging so that you could do that in a rotation set in three different degrees. Next, please. But I feel the most important and the key feature of this unit is that no patient, no one patient is the same as any other patient. You need to evaluate, and as you see the x-rays on the bottom, there's many times different areas of the cervical spine that's more severe than others. So instead of having the same type of inflation or the same type of traction to this, every single patient that you see, this adjustable inflator, which is called a pointable constrained inflator, have five positions to direct what you feel as the doctor is the best position for the patient. It also has a, an ability to adjust that to the patient's comfort level. So it could be adjusted to, to, from position five, which is a direct contact on the occiput, all the way down, that was position one, I'm sorry, to position five, which would be all the way down to the lower cervical of the thoracic area. And as you can see, where it can be directed on the bottom of the x-rays that are included in that slide. Next, please. You want to determine the appropriateness of the device and the setting that you need to use. This is just a general guideline. It does come with the unit. You also want to determine your own treatment protocol for the patient, again, to the patient's exact needs. But then you can inflate the bladder to pain tolerance for 15 to 20 seconds, and you repeat for 10 to 12 sets or based on patient tolerance. You evaluate the potential increase in pressure and static holding time to achieve the treatment goals you want to achieve. And of course, that again is based on patient tolerance. You have a physician instruction sheet for use that you could just review. Next. Also, you have the guide to show you the approximate compressions of the bulb and the type of poundage you will, you will get out of those bulbs compression. So if you go from the left to the fourth, there's one bulb compression all the way up to 20. And you can see that this unit is capable of producing anywhere from one pound of force up to 47 to 51 pounds of traction, which usually would never be the case of needed up to that degree. Remember what we said in earlier, 25 to 30 or 35 pounds would probably be sufficient enough for any condition. We said this before, that it helps you in conjunction, of course, with your adjustment to treat a patient and their condition more effectively. It definitely enhances the functional restoration and improving, improving of recovery time. And it achieves improved outcomes for your patients. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. LaMonica. That was excellent information. I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question on your computer panel, typically it's on the right side, there should be a section for you to type in your question and hit send. What we're going to do at the end of the webinar is I'm going to read the questions out loud, and then I will have our panelists um, answer the question if they're directed to them or if they're directed to me, I will answer them. So um, you're going to be kept anonymous, so don't hold back on your questions. If you think it's too basic or silly, don't worry about it. Just type in your question, hit send. I'm going to answer them, or we're going to answer them on a first-come, first-served basis. So sometimes we get a ton of questions. Questions, sometimes we don't get any. So uh, we'll see at the end of the webinar how many questions come in. So now I'm going to talk about getting paid. We got a lot of great information on back braces, uh, the BioBack and the Prados as far as the clinical application, what to look for, what not to look for, the quality of the product, excellent information. And there are a lot of choices out there when it comes to uh, traction and back braces. But in my, recommend, in my opinion, these two products are the top on my list. So if you're interested in purchasing these products or learning more, contact Valve Pro Supplies. Um, Donna, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Donna, Donna I'd like to introduce Donna. She is from Valve Pro Supplies. Donna, would you like to tell anyone, tell everyone about the, the company and what you guys offer? Yes, thank you. And I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We're very happy to sponsor. Um, Valpro Supplies is dedicated to providing quality and superior DME products to our healthcare providers. Um, we have products that from our top manufacturers, again, uh, we do provide BioBack and products. We're very happy to do that. We have cervical traction units, cervical collars, lumbar traction, lumbar support belts. We provide upper and lower extremity bracing and electrotherapy. And we're very happy to accommodate any other specific needs that the doctor has. Um, we have a variety of purchasing options. I know uh, Marty's going to go through some getting paid uh, issues and billing. But there are two ways that our doctors uh, uh, buy our products, either a direct purchase from Valpro Supplies. And what makes us unique is that our trained staff, along with Marty, will give you the information that's necessary in order for us to train your staff on how to build those products and properly get paid, letters of medical necessity and documentation. We found that there are doctors that really don't want to do direct billing themselves, so we will handle any billing issues for you, and you can call Claire again uh, to work out those arrangements. Um, we also, for the next 30 days, to thank everyone for attending the webinar, we are offering special pricing on all of our DME products uh, within the next 30 days. So if you are interested in finding out more about our products and more about the special offers that we're having, you can contact Claire again at 1-855-779-2076, or you can email valprosupplies at AOL.com. Again, we'd like to thank you uh, for today's webinar. Okay, Donna, stay with us. We're going to get back to you in a few minutes. Now I'm going to talk to everyone about getting paid. You heard about the clinical application and the quality of the product. Let me talk to you a little bit about how to get paid for these devices. Um, so now, first thing, I just want to go through some general recommendations. The first thing you need to do, everyone, is contact your state board and find out if ordering and supplying patients with DME is within your scope of practice. As far as I'm concerned, in my opinion, it's within the scope of every chiropractic practice in the country. But again, you need to check with your state board. Now, these products can pay very well, right? You're probably aware of that. Many of you listening to this are probably are, you know, wondering, you know, how do I get paid for these devices? Well, before you just go out and start prescribing these and billing, make sure you feel comfortable with your recommendations. Make, feel you, make sure you feel secure and confident prescribing and ordering DME. This isn't something you should just jump into. You need to feel comfortable explaining the medical necessity to patients, to attorneys, insurance companies, malpractice carriers, state board agencies, anybody that could come snooping around asking you why you're ordering the DME, you want to be able to answer them with confidence. Now, you may have already, you may be presently supplying patients with DME. Just stay on top of all the changes. There are changes that occur all the time. 
Some um, states require um, site visits. Some states, like in Florida, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, it's called ACA, in the state of Florida, requires that chiropractors get a home medical equipment license when they're prescribing TENS devices. So all these rules and changes are out there. Please stay on top of it. You must contact all the carriers you bill and get their DME billing coding and documentation and referral arrangement policies and guidelines. And please, just don't create cookie cutter orders. Like every patient on the second visit, we're going to get a Prados. Every patient on the third visit, we're going to give them a lumbar brace. Do not, I repeat, do not do that. So let me go through some of the codes. These are the codes that you need to know in order to be able to bill for these services. Now, if a cash patient comes into your office today and you want to supply them with a bio back, fine. This patient doesn't have insurance. Give them the bio back. Collect the cash. Write down what you did. Do an exam. Do a history. Write down the clinical necessity. But you don't have to bill this code. The code you see on your screen is the HICPIX code for the bio back. It's a lumbar orthosis. Dr. Graff described this earlier, and that's L0627. Then we have L0631. Again, this is a lumbosacral orthotic. It's a larger brace. It goes from the sacral coccygeal junction up to T9. There's been an update to these codes. You'll see at the end of the description of this code, it says prefabricated item that has been trimmed, bent, molded, assembled, or otherwise customized to fit a patient by an individual with expertise, an individual with expertise. That's you, doctors. So you can use these codes. If you're just handing the patient the box and you're not doing any type of um, specific um, um, measuring of the patient, it's a different code. There are different codes. I'm going to show you them in a few minutes. And then we have the L0637. This is a lumbosacral orthotic also. And um, it has sagittal and coronal control. Again, it has to be fit by a, 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 to a specific patient with an individual with expertise. Um, by the way, Dr. Uh, Graf or Dr. LaMonica, feel free to chime in if you have any other comments on these um, codes. Here also with um, HICPIX code L0641. This is brand new. As of January 1st of this year, this is a brand new code. If you're just billing and you're not sure what you're doing, you might bill the wrong code and then you might end up having a problem. Please stay in touch with us. Those of you that are not members of Target Coding, at a minimum, get on our email newsletter list. Go to TargetCoding.com, sign up for our email newsletter so you can stay up to date. Our, e our newsletter just a couple of weeks ago outlined all of these new codes. This is a brand new code as of 2014, L0641, but this says off the shelf, so it's different. L0642 is also a lumbar orthotic from L1 to L5. Yes, it produces intracavitary pressure to reduce, to reduce load on the discs. It includes straps. Uh, padding, and remember, it's prefabricated off the shelf. There's no expertise involved. If there's no expertise involved by you, the provider, then you have to build these codes. Here's another one, L0643. By the way, that's L and the number 0, not the letter O. Make sure staff members, when you're entering these codes into your system, do not use the letter O. It's L0648, and then we have L0649. L0650. Now we're getting into a more complicated brace. This goes from the sacrococcygeal junction all the way up to T9. These are still off the shelf, prefabricated off the shelf, L0651. Now I'm going to share with you the cervical traction codes. These are some of the codes that have been associated with cervical traction. HICPIX code E0830. This is an ambulatory traction device, all types. Then we have E0849, traction equipment, cervical, freestanding frame, pneumatic, applying traction to force other than the mandible. Because some patients come in, you cannot put pressure on their jaw. If you've ever seen those over-the-door units, there's a lot of pressure on the jaw. Some patients can't handle that. They've had surgery or it causes problems. It's a contraindication, so you have to use a different type of cervical traction device. Then we have E0850. Traction stand, freestanding. Next, 
E0855 cervical traction equipment not requiring additional stand or frame. E0856 cervical traction device, cervical collar with inflatable air bladder. And here's another one. There's, a, there's many more. I've just picked the six most common. E0860 traction equipment over door cervical. Dr. LaMonica, are you there? I am here. Uh, are there any codes that you want to get into regarding the Prados, or do you want people just to contact Valpro for that? I think that it would be better better to contact Valpro because we do have our staff and Claire is an expert on that to really go over on an individual basis because I know there's going to be other questions and instead of opening them up to all those kind of questions, I'd rather have the time for maybe the other questions that are there. Yes, so my recommendation for everyone listening to this presentation, there could be some changes in the codes. That's what I've read up recently, that certain cervical traction devices have been categorized into one code um, recently, but that might be changing. So we, uh, I, I recommend that you contact Claire at Valpro Surprise to get the latest. We don't want to uh, you know, confuse you by giving a code uh, to you today and then it changes tomorrow. So just a, a couple of closing comments. The DME, whether it's lumbar braces, cervical traction, whatever you're using, canes, pillows, collars, whatever it is, it must be reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis of the patient. The diagnosis is key. Plus, you must do a very thorough history, an exam. Set goals for patients. Now, for those of you that are ordering the braces, make sure you create a prescription and order. Make sure the order is signed and dated. Make sure your documentation shows that breadcrumb trail leading up to the DME. Like there are certain DME devices that you must um, do some over-the-counter um, you know, um, items first. The patient must go through a trial of other things before you start implementing or selling the DME in your practice. So a letter of medical necessity may be required in order to get DME authorized and or reimbursed. A letter of medical necessity also helps appeal denials. So again, you want to contact all the carriers you bill and find out what their policies and guidelines are on lumbar bracing and cervical traction before you start billing insurance companies. Please do that. It's very important. The, many insurance companies just give you their rules and guidelines. Why not know that? If you're billing United Healthcare or Cigna for a lumbar brace, go to their website. Go to Cigna's website, put in the search, traction, lumbar bracing, and it gives you a lot of really good information. Those of you that are members of Target Coding, if you want that information, we'll get it to you. So if you want that information, again, this is only for members of Target Coding, send an email to amy at targetcoding.com and, and let, us, let her know which insurance companies you would like to get the policies and guidelines on lumbar bracing and cervical traction. Okay, so let's see. Again, this webinar has been sponsored by Valpro Supplies. Call Claire at 1-855-779-2076 for more information. Marty, may I ask something? Sure. Uh, one of the services that Valpro Supplies does is exactly what you were talking about right there. Clients of Valpro uh, are more than happy to help you through the protocol and procedures that are needed to do whenever you are ordering any form of durable medical equipment DME product. They have the, the uh, verification, the authorizations, and or any of the uh, medical necessity letters that you need. So that's one of the services that, that makes Valpro a little bit different too. I know uh, Donna didn't mention that to that degree, but they do an excellent job with that situation and Claire is great at that. She's an expert. Excellent. So just a few closing comments before we get to Q&A. Dr. Graff, Rick, Donna, anybody, anyone would like to say something before we get to questions and answers? Good. Everybody's good? Okay, so I just want to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Again, um, contact Valpro Supplies. Contact Target Coding if you uh, have any questions on our products and services. So now we're going to get to questions and answers.